Spring is the time when woodlands really, really thrive. The spring ephemerals are going off, there's lots of small wildflowers, but summer is the time of the prairie. And to me, it's one of the most exciting. There's so much in bloom, there's birds nesting, there's tons of activity, and there's just so much to see. So today we're out at a local prairie and go around and see what we're gonna find. So asters are an incredibly diverse group of plants and they come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, the petals, the actual flower parts are different on all of them. Um, and hopefully we'll see a range of different types of asters out on the prairie today. A lot of the earlier blooming asters, like the cone flowers, the silphiums, those are starting right now, but some of the older flowering ones like goldenrod, um, eupatoriums, those aren't quite blooming yet. And it's really like the start of aster season, the yellows, the oranges, the bright colors, um, and then later in the fall, some of the yellows and purples. A particular favorite one of mine, which is one of the comb flowers, is Retibita pinnata, or uh, the pale-headed or gray-headed cone flower. And these are the petals, but the flowering parts are actually up here. And this is the difference between disc and ray florets. And unfortunately, this one doesn't quite have any pollen on it yet, so you can't see that. But this brown part, these all start opening, and that's where the actual pollen and the nectar source is for pollinators. But it's a really cool plant with these lanceolate leaves. They have um, you know, lots of forked teeth on them. Kind of rough, beautiful yellow color. Got this great flower. And here we have the purple cone flower, which is probably the most popular and famous, Echinacea purpurea. And in the back here, if you look, we've also got Echinacea pallida, pale purple cone flower. Now here is where you can really see where those flowers are on these asters. This soldier beetle is going to town on that flower. He's got to stick his face pretty far in there to get the nectar. But you've got these ray florets and the disc florets on top where the, the actual pollen and nectar is stored. And I believe this one is Helianthus helianthoides. And uh, the foliage here basically is sunflower looking sunflower, <laughs> which is Helianthus helianthoides, but really beautiful. Now prairie habitats like this tall grass type prairie that we see planted in central Illinois is evolved to grazing from bison and to fire, so frequent and occasional fires. And this fire really helps maintain the diversity in the landscape that you see here. So this gets burned back during a fire, things grow back really vigorously, and it increases flowering, it increases diversity of the plant life and the animal life that you see here. And all of these plants that have evolved in this region are adapted to this. They have really deep tap roots that can reach very deeply down into the soil to gather resources. They also have those deep tap roots because that's what helps them kind of survive these huge stochastic events like fires or if there's intense drought or things like that. These asters haven't quite bloomed yet. This is one of the sylphiums, Sylphium perfoliatum. Perfoliatum because the leaf cuts, the stem pretty much cuts through the leaf here. And they actually can pool water and uh, collect water in this cup of, the, cup of the plant. Not sure if there's actually any evolutionary advantage to that, but it does provide a little, uh, you know, water station for critters. But these are gonna produce really tall yellow blooms shortly. Now here's one of my favorite asters, Parthenium integrifolium, or wild quinine. And the reason it's one of my favorites is it just looks so different. It definitely has the flower structure of some of the more uh, eupatorium type asters. It has this dense cluster with some small narrow cups here for nectar. And what I really like is when you see pollinators coming to this plant, you can see they have white, uh, white pollen 
on their abdomens or on their legs as opposed to some of the brighter yellow pollen you see on some of the other asters. Here is a truly glorious patch of milkweed, common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca. It's actually taller than me. And we do have some small pollinators, some small insects over here like ladybugs, some soldier beetles. And the smell is intoxicating. It's definitely one of my favorite floral scents. But milkweeds are super unique in their floral structure. They have these kind of five horn cup flowers that are full of sweet nectar. And if you actually take one off, you can kind of taste that sweet nectar. I don't recommend eating it but it is kind of cool to taste the sweet nectar. Now, the rest of the plant is toxic, which is why it is so important to monarch caterpillars. So there is a white sap that if you break the foliage of a milkweed, you can see it kind of pouring out of the tissue of the plant. Now, this latex, this milky sap, contains cardiac glycosides, and those build up when a insect feeds on the foliage of the plant and that makes them very toxic which is why you see monarch caterpillars and some other caterpillars having those bright colors. So common milkweeds aren't just the host plant for uh, monarch caterpillars. They're for many other insects a, a really important nectar and food resource. But these really incredible evolved relationships over millennia are not unique just to monarchs and milkweeds. There's Every single plant that you can think of has one of those types of relationships with uh, either an insect, a bird, uh, a mammal, you know, something of the like, but particularly these insect hosts that require these plants to feed on and raise their young on. And that's why it's so important to plant as many native plants as you can, because all of these native plants that have evolved in this region have evolved with host insects that feed and raise their young on these plants. And without the plants, we just don't have the insects. Not quite in bloom yet, but a prairie gem for sure. This is the rattlesnake master, Eryngium yuccifolium. And the foliage on here gives you a little hint about maybe what family it's in, and also yuccifolium, foliage that looks like yucca leaves. But this plant is actually in the carrot family, Apiaceae. There is a larval host specific for this plant. It is the rattlesnake master borer moth, and it bores into the stem, raises its young, and emerges as a new moth. But foliage is just so cool. I love the color against the backdrop of the landscape. It's incredible. And when these open, each one of these will be a small little white flower that will attract dozens, billions of pollinators. They just love it. So all these birds you're hearing in the background, there's dick thistles, there's red-winged blackbirds, there's lots of sparrows like field sparrows. Uh, we also have some swallows flying around. I've seen uh, barn swallows as well as tree swallows. Uh, very active tonight and it's kind of that before dark getting their last calls in before, before they go to bed for the night. Also, I commonly see common yellow throats nesting in the prairie. They have that which do, which do, which do. Now this is Baptisia alba, and another clue to its family can be seen in the leaves. It has this pea-like foliage, and it is a fabaceae, and it has, you know, very similar to all peas, it has this kind of shape where the, the lip drops, splits to where the floral parts are, and that's where bumblebees, they come in and they force their way in, pollinate this plant, has this top lip with some beautiful little purple coloration in there. Tells pollinators exactly where they're supposed to go. 
really lovely plant and it has this kind of regal structure where it forms kind of a tree. And what's really fun is when they dry out in, this, in the summer or fall, they'll actually drift like little tumbleweeds across the prairie. Lovely plant. All right, it's exciting. This is one of my favorite prairie plants. This is the compass plant. This is Silphium laciniatum. Lanceolate leaves, these really cool, spiky and very sandpapery leaves. So the leaves and of this aster will actually orient themselves to avoid uh, as much sun exposure so they can conserve water and resources. So leaves that are oriented in an east-west direction uh, have less water loss and conserve resources better than those that don't. And these orient themselves as they emerge from, uh, from the plant. So as they're newly emerging leaves is when they orient themselves. 